Yes. Okay. I will not be talking about epidemics or metaphysics, though I sort of know what epidemics are. And I want to apologize for people who have heard some of this talk before. I am practicing, as people are wont to do with keeping current, for a talk, an invited keynote address at FLAIRS, the Florida AI Research Symposium, or something like that, next month. Um, this is work based on a long body of work with Emmanuel Burton and Nicholas Matei, and specifically some work on the notion of moral imagination and how to teach it. I want to start by telling you a little bit about teaching a particular story. Um, this is a story that we've been teaching for about three years. The story is about a boy, I think he's in high school, who has an app that allows people to request uh, local errands, local tasks. And it starts out really positive about the app. So he finds a lost child in a mall. He goes to the supermarket and tells somebody what's on the sale. And slowly throughout the story, the app becomes a little bit creepier. His mother uses the app anonymously to find out what role he got in the play. Um, his friend uses the app to get video of, quote, two girls kissing in a bar. And then complains that they weren't girls he knew. He needed to refine his request. And look, he only paid 50 cents for this and eventually becomes thoroughly creepy when the main character gets a request to check a motel parking lot for a particular license plate, his father's license plate. And it ends with a lot of discussion about how this app invades privacy, because the author does not believe in being subtle when there's something important at stake. Um, I actually, I understand that the author has tweeted exactly that, but he doesn't believe in subtlety. So what are some of the ethical issues with, this is the audience participation part, what are some of the ethical issues with an app like this? If you pay money for it, you can expect some sort of, uh, there's an implied warranty that it works, but what does it mean to work? That's really true of any crowdsourcing app. Well, yes. yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. Just because your request is legal doesn't mean that it's ethical. So they could be, you know, the little boy could maybe say, oh, I crossed the line. I'm not going to do something if they ask me to do something that's illegal, but they're asking me to do things that are becoming less and less. It hides the, the person doing the requesting. So the person who is doing the actual working on the license plate on behalf of the person, you know, it, it, the, the whoever requested to look at the, the license plate in the hotel parking lot, they're not going to get caught. Or they're, like, they're, not, they're not even going to get noticed because they, they were the ones doing the searching. If someone sees them looking at license plates in the parking lot, I don't remember if, it, if this story makes any mention of does the app even require that the request is made illegal? It doesn't. This isn't mentioned whether the app is requests are legal. And as several people pointed out, there's no discussion about reporting inappropriateness. Some of the issues over the last few years that we've taught this that have come up is that this app could be used just as Craigslist has been used, just as various other apps have been used to buy and sell drugs, to facilitate prostitution, to facilitate stalking. That's the one, one of the ones that I really focused on when I first read about it. Incidentally, 
this story was based on a real act. Um, at the time the story was written, the app was one of these research things. It was in a research paper, hadn't been made available. It has been since then. I was doing a model class in Singapore, as it happens. I, anyway, not here. And at some point in the middle of my model class, somebody says, do you realize that the guy who wrote that app is sitting right here? cool and I turned to him in the middle of my ethics professor um, shtick and I said well did you consider the ethical implications when you made this app and he said no so I sort of backpedaled I didn't haven't meant to put him on the spot and later I sat down with him over lunch and I said so are you concerned about the ethical implications? And he said, no. And I didn't know what to say, because I am concerned. Does that mean I think such apps shouldn't exist? Not necessarily, but I am concerned. I'm concerned that when we teach engineering, what we're teaching, is to do cool stuff, which, you know, isn't a bad thing in and of itself, but it's a bad thing if we don't consider what that cool stuff can be used to do. And if we believe, as so many of our students seem to believe, that if our intentions as developers control the use of the app, that's a problem because what we intend really has no effect on the real world, on the way the app is used. And we are not in the habit of looking at social context in order to decide, to think about the effect of the work we do. Um, what I am advocating, in part, in my advocation for teaching computer ethics, in my advocating for teaching in, in particular ways is that we develop a habit, a habitus as the classical scholars would say, of thinking about social context, thinking about ethical implications. So that's part one of the talk. I'm going to talk about some of the ways in which limited frameworks can affect the way we ask questions, the way we think about possible ethical implications. Um, I'll talk a little bit about teaching ethics, a little bit but less about teaching moral imagination, because honestly I haven't figured out what I'm doing, but I think it's important to try bring it back to computer ethics, and if I have time, talk about some of the folks who are out there doing some of this work. I will, you, it's okay if you can't read all of that. I will pick out bits of it. The point isn't the individual statements, but when I was reading about the notion of moral imagination, I found this wonderful paper from the 1980s by a woman at a little Kentucky college called Maria who was talking about a moral imagination in the context of peace studies. In the 1980s, one of the better ways to get information about politics was the pamphlets and stuff that the League of Women Voters used to put out. For some reason, I haven't found them as helpful in the last 20 or 30 years, but they used to be really good at summarizing political stuff. And so she looked at this is somebody in peace studies looking at what the League of Women Voters had to say about the arms race. This was U.S. Soviet. Everything she found, absolutely everything, was quantitative. How many missiles? How many missiles does it take to deter the enemy? Is deterrence working? What are the best ways of controlling the arms race? All of this starts from a point of view 
that it's about numbers, it's about deterrence, not about trying to work around, trying to change the focus. All of that is absolutely in the dominant paradigm of the time, which didn't work out so well. I mean, it, there were all sorts of assumptions like the US and the Soviet Union were among the only ones who were going to have nuclear weapons. Whoops. Um, so that's one narrow framework that limited the kind of questions and the kind of information that was available. You would think there were no peace movements in either country. Um, I had the opportunity to hear Ryan Kayla last summer, talk last winter, talking about some of this work. Are you familiar with the term the sharing economy? Um, I believe it was invented by the CEO of Uber. The idea is we have resources, we can share them. Think Airbnb. I have an extra room in my house, I can share that. And that language, Kalo kept talking about how that language determines how we think about what Uber and Lyft and Airbnb and Feastly. Have you ever heard of Feastly? I haven't either until I read this paper. Um, you, this is a sharing economy app where you can invite strangers to eat dinner with you. Her money. There's also one for sharing um, garden tools. Uh, I forget the name. So if you frame this as the sharing economy, you can talk, and they do talk, about efficiency, income flexibility, which is much better than living hand to mouth. Um, same thing, perhaps. They talk about how these apps create greater competition, just as Amazon created greater competition for bookstores. Um, I believe either yesterday or today was the last day that Briar Books was open. But, um, they talk about access to new resources. We can use that spare bedroom. We can use the car that was sitting idle in your garage or on the street. But Kalo and Rosenblatt talk about it as the taking economy. And I've taken these points directly from their paper. They talk about how when you go with Uber, when you go with Airbnb, when you go with Feastly, you are sidestepping regulations. And for some, that's a big plus until you eat something in a not cooked in a not very hygienic kitchen that's not very edible, um, until you discover that your skin color has a lot to do with whether you can get an Airbnb. There was a lawsuit about that a couple of years ago. Or whether you get picked up by a Lyft driver or so on. And of course, all of these apps track what you're doing. They invade your privacy. There are losses as well as gains from the app. And how you frame it, is it sharing or taking, really determines the kinds of questions that we can ask about. Well, I, I would just like to say, looking at the rewards for that, it, those even seem to be focusing on the economy part, not the sharing part. When I think about what are the, why would I want to share with people, I, you know, I'm usually thinking about how to increase the efficiency of the market. Right, but all of these apps are monetized. And one of Kalo and Rosenblatt is a lawyer and the other is an economist. So they have a bias. Um, and yes, people report that being a Lyft driver has social benefits because you interact with 
and the, that report out of MIT about how Lyft drivers basically make $1.50 an hour is probably not accurate. I haven't looked at all of that yet. So, I don't know if you've read any of the ProPublica studies. There's one that's gotten a lot of press in the discussion of bias data, and that is um, Compass software, which is used by all too many police organizations to decide whether an individual who's been arrested gets out on bail. And the single most predictive factor is skin color. Why is this? In large part because of the data that Compass was trained on which was from Florida, where apparently um, African Americans get arrested a lot more, so are perceived to be more likely to repeat offend. And so in places where that data may not have already been biased, we're still keeping them in jail longer, with obvious social cost. Like if you can't go to work, or social and economic costs. You can't be with your family. Um, don't know how much you can see, but this is from another ProPublica report. This was about Facebook taking ads for housing, where they were able to micro-target. It's a map, there's just a region highlighted they were able to micro-target ads for housing based on income and race, directly violating the 1965 U.S. Civil Rights Act, which outlawed what was called redlining. Banks used to do this. There were white neighborhoods, there were black neighborhoods, there were Hispanic neighborhoods, and if you didn't match the neighborhood, you didn't get a mortgage. This is a slightly different mechanism that recreates the same thing based on bias data, based on bias decision-making algorithms, and based on what somebody perceived to be optimizing income. So maybe that's too narrow a focus. This is a fascinating example. This is one you may not have heard of. Um, incidentally, in the, at the AI conference in May, I expect people will know the ProPublica stuff. This was a paper from 2010. A woman trained as an ethicist embedded in a medical device lab, development <coughs> lab. The lab was working on a device that would allow you to determine blood glucose levels through the skin. I think it was a combination of light and acoustic waves. Great thing, I don't know how much experience you have people with diabetes. I remember a colleague I, met, I was in Chicago with we were in a kind of sketchy neighborhood, drug dealers outside, we're there for brunch. And he walks over to a corner, pulls out a piece of flesh and sticks a needle in it. Well, that was actually injecting insulin. But what diabetics often do is test their blood sugar levels. They stick themselves with the needle. This requires, at the very least, that you go and you wash your hands, both the hand that's being stuck and the hand that's doing the sticking. And then you sit there and you wait for however long it is for the little chemical sensor to decide whether the blood you just drew is too low, what, what the sugar level is, and do you need insulin. It's disruptive. It's disruptive of social interaction. It's disruptive of work. It's particularly disruptive of any work that gets your hands dirty or that is in a 
unsanitary environment. It's really quite unpleasant. So there was this great idea. We could get away from that needle testing. But but it doesn't really work on dark skin. So if you're focused on the idea that this brings good, Great, at least the white people don't have to do that testing. But it changes the social dynamic. So an employer who has white diabetics on staff isn't as patient with dark-skinned diabetics who have to go test. Socially, people aren't as patient. So there becomes this extra onus, not only are you sticking yourself with a needle three times a day, or however often you have to test, but there are people sort of standing around saying, well, you don't need to do that. My uncle doesn't do that. So it changes and further disadvantages a group who in the US and in the Netherlands where this paper was written are already socially at a disadvantage. There's already bias. So here what I'm really saying is that not only do we need to look at an individual, how will this affect an individual who may or may not be able to cope themselves, but how does that interact with the social reality that's already here. Because if it disadvantaged uh, people with Roman toes, that, that's the second toe bigger than the, the big toe, longer than the big toe, we don't know about who's got Roman toes mostly. We don't care. That's not a socially disadvantaged group. We need to know the difference when we're analyzing the effect of our technology. So we need social frameworks as well as technical frameworks. And in the article she said that in the 80s, a similar system was designed for some other blood analysis. And it was approved by, I want to say the FDA, but I don't remember if it was US organization, with the caveat that they hadn't tested it on dark skin people. It probably wouldn't work as well. We can build it and then we can work out the um, ethical issues later. Yeah. Once it's released into the wild. So part of what's important, and I'll talk about different ethical theories in a slide or two, is who we consider. Who counts? Do women count as much as men? Do people who are not technically savvy count as much? If you go by, let's say, a utilitarian framework, the answer is everyone counts. Everyone counts as one. No half. If you think back to the voting rights, the history of voting rights in this country, that hasn't always been the case. Everyone counts as one, and we need social context. I'll talk to you later. Um, OK, before I go to this, any questions? Sort of, that, that was my very long introduction. Yes? My, my, what I wanted to say was we already have this deep problem with the diabetic in that uh, male employee cannot get pregnant so that has been being used as past in past as basis for discrimination. So I would say it's not a new problem. We already have examples of that sort of Yes. Thing. For a moment I wasn't sure where you were going, but absolutely. Um, and technically sex discrimination is illegal in this country, as is age discrimination. 
tell that to a 55 year old or a 60 year old looking for work. Um, and it, yeah. And the concern though is that technical full advances are going to make it even more easier, easy to discriminate. Oh, yeah. It's, 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 there are always so many things you could discriminate on. You had to stay in the physical space before, you know. Right. So, uh, I mean, that's the major concern is you can't provide the ability to discriminate. And what I'm going to argue at the end is that we need to try and work hard to make that more difficult to make that less appealing. But, yeah, and to legislate it as best we can. But as at least one computer science ethics textbook author, Deborah Johnson says, the law always lags technology. We don't, we don't legislate until the problem has happened or is on the precipice of happening. So really, there are many ways to slice and dice ethics. One is normative versus descriptive ethics. Normative ethics tell you what's ethical, what's right, what's wrong, which I don't think is all that useful because what's right and wrong about today's technology may not even apply in 10 years, 20 years. And our students are going to be working in the technology field for a lot longer than that, most of them. So I think it's more important to develop the habitus, the ability to describe where the ethical challenges are to describe the ways in which something can be used for good and for harm. And so when I teach, when my group teaches, and we teach in different places, we're focused on description, on learning that set of skills rather than on deciding the right answer. How do you do that? One of the ways is to keep changing the framework. Here are some of the ethical theories that I've been thinking about. At the moment, I teach mostly the first three. Utilitarianism, the idea is for any action, you can consider the effect on each person. Does it increase or decrease their utility? Add them all up, and you have a value. Fabulous, computational, not really. How do you know? How do you evaluate good and harm? If it's money, that's okay, maybe. But there's subtle things that aren't necessarily considered. We're not very good at evaluating utility, even about money. Okay, the next most computational seeming one, deontology, is often described as rule adherence. But the actual theory is much more than that. It's based on duty. What duty do you have to your country, to your religion, to your family, to your employer, to the world, broadly construed, to humanity? And how do you how do you evaluate actions in terms of these duties, and how do you weigh them? Because often, in each of these theories, there's conflict. Virtue ethics goes back to Aristotle, who said that we should each, as individuals, strive to be the best that we can be. To strive to embody and live as easily as possible the virtues that we choose. Very personal, but also moderating that. He talked about the golden mean, about not being excessive in any of your virtues. 
what's central in virtue ethics is the idea that you should practice, create a habitus of acting according to your virtues until it becomes easy, until you no longer feel conflicted. That's very difficult, but it's an aspirational goal. We should work toward this. I believe the ethics of care goes back to 1970s, 80s, and Carol Gilligan at Harvard and others trying to describe how middle-class white American women are trained to value connection to value care. It's an interesting theory because it is not universalist. And it is based on social interaction. And it's a surprisingly useful one to describe how individuals choose to act or don't choose to act. And the capability approach which Nussbaum and Sen introduced I'll talk a little more about in a minute or two. All of these are focused on living what the theory defines to be the good life. Whether the good life means one high in utility, one consistent with your duties or your virtues, or your abilities, your capabilities. Sorry for the wall of text here. Um, so this paper in 1993, Sen, by the way, is an economist, won the Nobel Prize for Economics, focused, or at least, I'm taking this from Vandenberg. I have not read the 1993 paper. Um, the abilities have to do with things you can do, but they also have to do with your mental health, your physical health, your bodily well-being, bodily integrity, and capability of experiencing the world through your senses, through your imagination, your thoughts, your emotions, your reasons, and your connections, and your ability to play which is an interesting thing to think about. If you live a life of constant toil, it's not a good life. You have no time to play. So why introduce three or five or seven different theories of ethics? Is it because those are the right ones? Not necessarily, but those give you different ways to look at decisions so that we can see different problems that might arise. We keep talking, I keep talking, going back to computer technology, things we're going to develop. And we want to be able to say what could possibly go wrong from over here and over here and over here because so much can. And we want to anticipate as much as possible. Giving different frameworks, I believe, though I have no empirical studies to show this, I believe they give us tools to imagine, to shift outside our normal perspective. We've been teaching for some time using fiction, using science fiction, but more broadly fiction. And that brings a lot of things to the table, brings a lot of things into the course that other courses might not have. And not by any means saying this is the right way to do it. There are reasons that I like to teach this way that seem to be fairly effective for most students. What stories bring us are characters who make decisions in, at least in the good stories, in complex settings. They have conflict. They have characters you think about and that stay with you, I hope. 
I want my students to remember not only what we talked about, but how it was complicated. And stories can leave us, good stories, can leave us with lack of resolution. They can leave us without the punchline sometimes, without the author telling us what the right answer is. And while I very much like the work of the author I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, sometimes he's a little heavy handed. Sometimes I'd rather leave it open what the right thing to do would be. Um, I was reading another essay, I did not put it into another article that did not make it into my slides, where somebody who teaches moral imagination in the context of social work, maybe, said that he ends his first assignment with, sit comfortably with confusion. So, here's what I like about stories. If a story connects emotionally, then ethical choices, as ethical decision making is memorable. And if the class disagrees, which fairly often happens, then that discussion becomes sometimes impassioned. And those are the discussions that I hope are memorable. Where a student doesn't go away saying, yes, we figured out the right answer, but goes away thinking, wow, maybe it was this and maybe it was that, and I need to think about both, or all three, or however many. This might be too much text, but this lack of resolution can come from questions about what's actually happening. It can come from unreliable narrators, where we're sitting there thinking, we don't really know what's going on. We just read a story in class yesterday where this was definitely the case. Um, we want to look at how characters' beliefs affect their analysis affect their decisions because that helps us imagine how technology could affect people with different beliefs. We want to know what their, how their values affect all of this, how their ethical frameworks affect this. And students report that when they are assigned to analyze a story from a particular ethical framework and then they shift to another one, it changes the whole story. The student said that out loud and I was kind of, excuse me, kind of excited. Yes. Um, big question, how do stories help us inhabit other ways of understanding the world? How do they help us think about things we wouldn't necessarily think about otherwise? And the real reason that I teach computer ethics with science fiction is that I like reading science fiction, and I hope that most of my students do as well. For somebody who doesn't like fiction, doesn't like science fiction, this would be a dumb way to teach. There are other ways to get at multiple views. I do not yet have permission from my students. I have a wonderful picture from last week where we had class outside. And they got up, they stretched, and they formed small groups to discuss the story, mostly standing up. And you can see in their body language, most of the students, not all of them, most of them are leaning forward. They are excited. They are engaged. It's a wonderful picture, but for a can't reveal who was in the class. These group discussions are fabulous because they crowdsource. They give different viewpoints. 
they remove the teacher from the front of the room. They remove the voice of authority and let the students figure out. And I'd say every computer science teacher these days is invested in discovery-based learning because why else do we have labs? Why else do we assign programs? Except that that's how we believe students learn. And I think this is a really important part of discovery ethics. Part of what I look for is a theory of mind. That's a technical term. It means being able to imagine someone else's point of view. And not everybody can do that. But the stories, I think, help. And that's really what we push for with the stories and any other way that I would be teaching ethics. I would still be pushing for trying to inhabit different viewpoints. But for me, fiction helps. Moral imagination, two words moral, kind of talked about that a lot, imagination, creativity. I don't know how to teach that. All I know how to do is to encourage, to give students opportunities to be creative, be open to where they lead. I let students choose the format for their finals. And I have five standard formats, and almost every year somebody comes up with something new. Spoken word poetry. Um, that one was good. The musical the student wrote was not only not great, but I didn't get to hear the music, though he claimed there was. Um, debates, all sorts of possibilities. There isn't a right answer. There isn't a right answer to how do you teach creativity? There's just flexibility and a willingness to be open to different methods. Ultimately, this is about thinking about the effects of our technology. And we can't predict everything. Um, science fiction author Ken Liu said to me, science fiction authors are really bad futurists. They're not good at predicting. I don't necessarily agree with him. We can predict a lot. We can imagine, especially if we have developed this habitus of framing, reframing. Before we ask the questions, look at the framework in which we're asking. And just an example of technology where it really looks from the outside like they didn't ask the questions. Could they have predicted the election manipulation? Maybe. It's not like the idea of manipulating people's votes was new. It's just the technology enabled it to be done very efficiently. Yes, they did appoint an ethics board. You guys hear about that? It, they stopped it two days later. Um, but that was for other reasons. Or as one of my students said, for reasons. Um, so just to reiterate one of the big points, because I'm getting toward the end. Um, what can we do? We can intend our technology for good use. And I'm not even sure Facebook did that. But we could choose to not develop something. We could choose to build in controls for the malefaction, the bad acting that could be used. We can build in the controls. They may or may not work. We can work with lawyers and legislators if we foresee potential problems. Not everybody thinks that's a good idea. Um, we can design interfaces that at least steer users towards some things and away from others. A troll is going to work around that. 
we're not going to be able to prevent all bad news. Um, there was a record label years ago with the motto, anything's a weapon if you hold it right. Um, Righteous Bay re Records, I don't think they use that anymore. But we cannot control how things are used. We can just make it a little harder to use them for harm. There's lots of organizations um, that are working on ethics. I will post these slides. They all have hyperlinks. A um, couple of things I want to point out. Harvard and MIT, Stanford and MIT, are, have an ethics and governance of AI initiative. The European AI Alliance met for 18 months re up until recently, came up with guidelines for the EU. It was 50 people, roughly, um, from all different professions, different um, fields, not just computer science law, sociology, and they met for two days at a time every month for many months, talking intensely about what can go wrong and what they can do. Um, they, I believe they came up with the ethics guidelines for trustworthy AI. We have some other studies in the US a few years ago under Obama, we have um, Trump's announcement that the US government cares about AI. I don't remember exactly what that is. It's one of those unfunded things. Um, we've had a number of studies thinking about this. There is funding for researchers to continue thinking about it, looking at fairness, transparency, debiasing data, trustworthy AI, coming out of industry, the sort of academics, National Science Foundation in the US, the military, and that's the ones that I apply for. Those are all the ones all available in the US. I know there are others out there, but I haven't submitted proposals to them yet, or can't. So I just want to wrap up on a positive note. I think that there's enormous challenges ahead that social, economic, and psychological challenges that are going to come out of the work that we do as computer scientists, particularly because I'm talking to an AI conference, particularly work in AI. I think there's some very scary stuff coming down the bend, but I think there's also an enormous will in government, in academia and industry, even in the military, to make it better. I think we can. I think we need to teach students that this is important. And I think we need to teach students that they can't simply look as, excuse me, as engineers and whatever utilitarians or deontologists or whatever their home ethics framework is. They need the flexibility. They need the multiple viewpoints that that ideological flexibility gives them. And I think we can teach them.
uh, and tries to uh, introduce fixes so they can say how much we do these sorts of things. And, and so there's a development process which, right. which is based around testing with real users. So it, it seems to me that that's what, what should have happened in the story, not rather than the keeping going without changing uh, the, 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 the way the program works. That's worked really well for Facebook. Um, I think ideally you're right, but you know if I say that it occurs to me if I say that they are never going to get a Facebook grant, am I? Um, this implies a willingness to maintain the software and to devote resources, corporate resources, to something that doesn't bring in more money. Well, usually, uh, in, in the commercial world, you are, you are writing software because people want to use it. Right. And want to pay to use it. Yes. So there is a source of money there. Right, uh, but if people are buying it for nefarious purposes, they're still buying it. They may also be downloading it illegally, but that's a whole different thing. They're probably not going to the source and asking for fixes. I just wanted to comment on that kind of idea of putting the piece of software out there, having it be misused, pulling it, patching it, putting it back out. You still need the moral definition because the fundamental tenet of why you built the software, what it is core and core at its core intended to do, might inherently be exploitable. Like I think Facebook is a perfect example of this because no matter how many trolls you try to catch, squash, I'm not sure what to do with trolls, but I guess you can just that. Um, they, they always get clever and they can always circumvent that. Just, well, just like um, security is a constant battle, a constant. I, I feel like that has a, something that you can eventually get right. Barring computer architecture, but I think some things are. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Did you? No. And the example of the first app, where you can ask people to do these do in the computer area, no, the, the, the developers of the app don't have any incentive to fix their app because, as far as they're concerned, it's working just great. They're making more money. If they fix, if they fix their app, they're going to make losing money. If people aren't going to want to use it anymore. So you have to find some way to. to much of what you said about looking at the ethical implications in the app applies directly to looking at the security implications of an app. Uh, it seems that there's, although it's a different subject, people as they develop something from the very beginning have to worry about what are the security implications it's throughout the entire life cycle of development and implementation and maintenance. Um, is there something overarching that comprises both security and ethics and maybe other stuff that we should be looking at instead? Give me a minute, because there is a phrase somewhere in my brain that I'm, but it's basically the social context of the technology. I would say security is part of the social context in the, how it's going to be used and misused, just as ethical implications are about how it affects and is used by people. So, yes, social context, I would say it's closest to human-computer interaction. Um, and there is a field of that that I think includes, or at least overlaps both issues. Ethics also has to do with how we interact as humans, and I haven't really talked about that. We certainly do in the class, but that is the part, perhaps, that isn't covered by the overlap as much.
questions? Well, oh, thank you very much. Keep current by coming next week. We've got uh, at least one talk.